Hi, this is Scott again, and this is the last lecture in this class, Fundamentals of Statistics and Computation for Neuroscientists, and we'll be continuing to talk about frequency analysis this time, uh, focusing on phase and looking at uh, the neuroscience applications of calculating coherence between regions. So, uh, why is phase and specifically coherence important? Um, there was a pop there's a popular theory uh, today called communication through coherence, which was popularized by Pascal Fries in a paper about a decade ago, in which he hypothesized that the if two neural populations indicated here by the circles of different colors, if two neural populations are synchronized then they can better communicate with each other. So these red and blue oscillations, or these red and blue populations, uh, have, are synchronized in that when the red population is at its peak excitability, at which it's firing, it's firing the most action potentials, the uh, blue population is also at that peak excitability. And if the action potential, potentials are uh, going through projection from the blue population to the red population or the red population to the blue population without much synaptic delay, uh, the action potential will arrive in the other region during its excitable phase. And uh, the hypothesis is that is if, a, if this action potential that causes synaptic input into the red region during its excitable phase, then it can uh, better influence the neural computation in that region. So since these red and blue oscillations are synchronized, uh, the action potentials from one region will arrive at the other region during its most excitable state and be able to influence the neural computation in that region. However, uh, the blue and black uh, oscillations are out of sync. They're not synchronized such that when the blue oscillation is at its excitable phase and fires X potentials, these X potentials are going to uh, reach the synapse in the black population during its low excitability phase. So if this black population has a lot of inhibition, during that phase, then the this excitatory input from the blue uh, region won't yield an action potential in the black region, and so it will pretty much be like it's not processed, it's not uh, influencing the spiking activity of that network. So one example of this that Pascal Fries uh, outlined in his paper is quantifying the cortical spinal coherence, uh, the coherence in uh, a frequency range, a gamma frequency range between about 40 and 70 hertz between the motor cortex measured in MEG and the contralateral muscle uh, measured with uh, EMG or electromyography. And on the top plot here is showing the hazard rate as a function of time and time is on the x-axis and the hazard rate is increasing pretty much meaning that the subjects are more ready to uh, make a movement or respond at this uh, at this high hazard rate time later in the trial and that's indicative of the uh, decreased response time later in the trial. And later in the trial, we also see this increased coherence in the gamma range uh, between the cortex and the, uh, the muscle electrical activity. And that's quantified by this plot where the correlation between these two regions and the gamma frequency band is high, uh, and that's not the case for the frequencies outside of this frequency range. <laughs>
So stepping back to the basics a bit, first, how can we quantify the phase of an oscillation? And uh, how we do that is we basically adopt the standard of the phase of a cosine oscillation, where at input phase zero, the cosine function is at the peak of its oscillation, uh, zero or two pi or four pi or anything like that. Um, it's at its peak of the oscillation, whereas if the input to the cosine is around pi or negative pi or three pi or five pi, it's at the trough of the oscillation. So when we consider phase, we just want to restrict these values between negative pi and pi, because that spans the whole, whole possibility of phase ranges as it's just periodic with period two pi. So the peak um, will occur at phase zero. So when we will when we will talk about phase zero in the coming slides, we'll be referring to the peak of an oscillation. Whereas if we're talking about phase pi or negative pi, we'll be talking about the trough of the oscillation. Uh, values between zero and pi will be this decaying edge of an oscillation, whereas phase values between negative pi and zero will uh, be this be the rising uh, phase of the oscillation. So an example of filtered voltage signal is in red here. Uh, it's a beta oscillation, and in black is the instantaneous phase over time. So at each peak of the beta oscillation, we are at phase zero, at the trough, uh, we're at phase pi and negative pi. So now we'll cover how to actually calculate that phase time series. So up at the top here, we start with our raw voltage signal. Uh, this is a, an example of beta oscillation in the motor cortex. Notice how it's very non-sinusoidal, but when we filter it in the uh, beta oscillation range between about 13 and 30 hertz, then the, uh, the filtered signal is very sinusoidal. And here we used a complex wavelet, um, a complex Morley wavelet uh, that we used to calculate amplitude in the last lecture. We're going to use the same uh, type of wavelet to calculate phase in this lecture. So now our filtered signal ha is two-dimensional for each time point. It has a real and imaginary time point. So again, we're going to return to the complex plane, but instead of focusing on the amplitude of the vector in that plane, we're going to be focusing on the phase of the uh, vector in this plane. And the phase is the angle between this positive real axis and the vector that we'll see. So if we look at this time point in green that has a maximal real component, but a, a zero imaginary component, uh, this vector will lie along the positive real axis, and so its phase is going to be zero, which we see as the case in this instantaneous time series throughout on the bottom. However, if we look at a time point at which the imaginary uh, imaginary component is positive, but the real component is zero, then we're going to just lie along the imaginary axis. axis. And in this case, the phase is 90 degrees, or we'll refer to it as pi over two, which is the case uh, approximately here. And in the red label, and then the red vector here, we have a zero imaginary component again, but this time our real component is negative. So we lie along the negative real axis, and this will have a phase of 180 degrees, or pi. And remember that a phase of pi is equivalent to a phase of negative pi, because phase is periodic with period 2 pi. And finally, 
if our uh, real component was zero again and our imaginary component was uh, negative, then we would have a phase of negative pi over 2. And we do this calculation for every time sample, and in many time samples will lie somewhere in between the quadrants, and that's why we get this steadily increasing uh, phase from negative pi to pi as we go through the cycle, as we start at the trough and then go into the ascending phase, the phase will go to zero when we hit the peak, and then as we start to descend through the oscillation cycle, uh, our phase increases up to pi until we hit the trough, and at the trough, we just reset the phase to negative pi uh, in order to restrict our phase limits between negative pi and pi. So that's how we calculate phase, and there have been a lot of applications of looking at the phase of an oscillation in neuroscience recently. So one idea, uh, one application is called a phase reset, in which the uh, an oscill a certain event will cause an oscillation to adopt a certain phase. So in this case, there. Um, there's just some oscillatory process, uh, oscillatory electrical activity happening before time t1 uh, that's pretty much random in time, but once event t1 happens, then we immediately, then this oscillation is reset to the ascending phase of the oscillation, uh, exactly in the middle here. So that's what we mean by phase resetting time t1. Uh, if each of these blue lines is a trial, uh, at each trial event t1 causes the phase of the oscillation to reset, and so we'll have the same phase uh, for every trial at this event and then immediately after before the oscillations start to desynchronize again. So a way of calculating and estimating this is by using something called the phase locking value, and the formula is given here, which briefly uh, we have in the example I just showed uh, a capital N number of trials, and for a given time point, say uh, 100 milliseconds after the event happens, we want to see, okay, is the phase of this oscillation locked across trials? So in order to do that, we have we calculate the phase value at this time point for every trial, and then sum over the complex exponential of these phase values, and then take the average magnitude, or the magnitude of the average of that sum. So this, these are some visual illustrations of it, where each arrow here is indicates the phase of an individual trial. So in this case on the left, all of the trials have a phase around phase zero, so they're all about the peak of the oscillation. So we would sum up all of these vectors and then take the uh, magnitude of that sum. So since all of these vectors are pointed in about the same direction, they're going to sum up to an appreciable value. And the magnitude of this, uh, this vector is called the phase locking value. Um, however, in this example, it seems like each vector is pointed in a random direction, so the phase at this time point is random from trial to trial. So therefore, when we add up all of these vectors, they're going to uh, cancel each other out and end up around zero. So the phase locking value, which is indicated by the magnitude of this, of this mean vector, uh, will be very low because the phase 
for each trial is not consistent with one another at this time point. So going back to the, this example, before the time uh, of the event, where in each trial our the phase of this oscillation is pretty random, uh, we would be in this situation here where uh, the phase the phases from each trial will cancel out when we sum them together, and so we'll have a low phase locking value. However, immediately after the event, the phase from trial to trial will be very highly correlated with one another, and so when we sum these vectors and take the magnitude of the mean of these vectors, then uh, we'll get a higher phase locking value. So uh, doing this for each time point, um, we may want to ask, okay, is this a significant phase locking value? Uh, we only have one number though. Uh, we have the phase locking value at a given point in time, say the phase locking value is 0.5. How do we know if this is um, better than chance? And uh, one way to test this is using Rayleigh z-test, and that is a test for non-uniformity in circular data. So what that means is this uh, test would return a null result if just the phase of each data point uh, is ran, is comes from a uniform random distribution. Uh, so as a reminder, the phase locking value is uh, expressed here and the Z score for the Rayleigh test is calculated by N, capital N, where N is the number of trials, times the phase locking value squared. And if you want to calculate a p-value associated with your experiment, uh, where you have a phase locking value at a specific time point and a specific number of trials, then that calculation is here. So if this com or this exponential function is a value less than 0.05, then you will say like, okay, this is a significant phase locking value and that it is generated by a non-uniform phase distribution. So you can see that as you increase your phase locking value, that will make this the exponent in this exponential more negative, and so your p-value will get even lower. Similarly, if you have a constant phase locking value, but you increase your number of trials, then that will also decrease your p-value. So this formula makes sense. Uh, one confound for the phase locking value I wanted to bring up is how we could get a significant phase locking value um, after an event without actually observing a phase reset. So in the top plot here, each trace is uh, representing one trial in which all I did was generate white noise and band pass it in an alpha frequency range between eight and 12 Hertz. And then uh, this, made it so the phase on every trial is just completely independent of one another. However, in the bottom plot, uh, I used the random uh, alpha oscillations for each trial, uh, as in the top plot, but I just added a Gaussian evoked response in response to the event. So how I designed the data is that there was no phase reset in the alpha oscillation, but just there was an evoked response, some non-oscillatory component in the data. However, when we go through and calculate the phase of these oscillations, as we would expect in the purely bandpassed white noise uh, situation, the phase is just uh, random over time across trials. However, when I added in that evoked potential uh, and do this analysis, the result is that the alpha phase component is synchronized over time. 
as a function. Uh, it's synchronized immediately after the event across trials. Um, and even though this, these alpha oscillations are the same as in the random case, just by introducing this evoked response caused essentially a phase reset. And um, here again is the phase of each trial across time. Uh, and on the bottom here, I calculate the phase locking value at each point of in time. So when there is no evoked potential, the phase locking value remained very low. Um, but when the evoked potential got very high, or when I introduced the evoked potential, the phase locking value increased dramatically, even though there was no phase reset in this case. So looking at the raw data and seeing what you actually have is very important before jumping to conclusions based off of your metric. So a uh, second application I wanted to talk about was using phase and instantaneous phase to calculate the coherence between two electrical signals. So in this, um, in this example that I pulled from a paper back in 1997, uh, there are two motor cortical recordings uh, that have very, that look very similar to one another. So we, we might want to ask, like, oh, are these two electrical signals coherent? And this may be simply due to volume conduction, where these two electrodes are picking up the same neural activity. Or it may be due to a noisy reference that has this oscillation component in it. But let's just not worry about that for now and just simply test, okay, are these two signals coherent? And we want to uh, we want to claim yes they are, but more so than just visually looking at it. So in order to do that, we're going to use the phase locking value again. Uh, so in this example, we have three electrodes: a blue one, a black one, and a gray one. And their plot, their voltage time series over two seconds is plotted on top here. And uh, each of them. For each of them, I calculate the instantaneous phase over time, and that's plotted on the bottom here. And what you can tell is from both of these plots is that the black and the gray oscillations are very coherent with one another. So once the black oscillation peaks, the gray oscillation peaks very soon thereafter. However, the these two oscillations are pretty independent from the blue oscillation here. And that is also represented in the phase time series. So in this case, we can calculate a phase locking value by looking at the phase difference between the black and the gray oscillation at every point in time. And this is a circular histogram of these phase differences. So again, treating each phase difference as a vector in complex space, we would uh, add up all of these vectors and divide by the number of vectors and then take the magnitude of the result as we did in the phase locking value formula here. So when considering the black and the gray oscillations, we would get a very high phase locking value. In contrast, if we calculate the phase locking value between the black and the blue oscillations where there is no uh, consistent relationship between the peaks and troughs of these oscillations, the circular histogram is going to look pretty random uh, where the phase difference between these two oscillations at any point in time is pretty random. And so the phase locking value will be pretty low. And for coherence, again, we just got one phase locking value out of that analysis. Um, so one way in order to do a statistical test on this data is to use bootstrapping statistics, which was covered earlier in this class. So in this case, we have a, a, a 
neural signal, uh, these two neural signals, A and B, that are coherent with one another, the true PLV value is 0 0.9. Uh, and we can create a null distribution of phase locking values by randomly shifting one of those time series with respect to the other. So in this bottom plot, the blue phase time series is the same. However, I introduced a random shift of the orange time series. So in this case, it looks like I shifted the orange time series backwards by about one second. And in this case, since I shifted these two time series with respect to each other, uh, the phase locking, uh, there is much less phase locking between these two signals. So if I do this shifting uh, a thousand times and calculate a phase locking value at each point in time, I end up with this null distribution of phase locking values uh, that we would expect um, if there is no uh, significant coherence between these two signals. However, we notice that our true phase locking value is significantly higher than this distribution. So by dividing the number of occurrences that the null distribution ascended the true PLV value uh, and dividing that by the total number of uh, surrogate samples we did, which was a thousand in this case, then we get our p-value. In this case, none of the surrogate, uh, surrogate shifts had a phase locking value greater than, um, greater than the true phase locking value, so our p-value is less than one over a thousand. So a final application I want to discuss is uh, concerns the, the perception of a stimulus. So there's uh, some evidence that if you have a, in this case it's an infraslow oscillation over time, where in green this is the phase of a very slow oscillation over time. If you present a visual stimulus uh, randomly in time, the subject will perceive that stimulus better at certain phases of this infraslow oscillation. So in this plot, uh, again, green is the phase fluctuating from negative pi to pi of that oscillation, and a hit is when the subject perceived the visual stimulus, and miss is when the subject uh, did not perceive that stimulus. Actually, this was a somatosensory stimulus. Um, and this infraslow fluctuation was measured with EEG from electrode CZ. And we notice from this plot directly that the subject was more likely to perceive the stimulus during the rising phase of the oscillation. So between negative pi and zero, where we're going from the trough of the infraslow oscillation to its peak, compared to the decay phase of this oscillation between zero and pi. So how do we quantify that? And we use the phase locking value for this, but uh, we use it a few times, so we obtain this new metric that uh, Bush et al. Uh, defined, or maybe they didn't define it, but they used it uh, back in 2009, called the phase bifurcation index. And pretty much this phase bifurcation index is high. It's uh, if the two groups that you're comparing, so say uh, perceiving the stimulus is one group and not perceiving the stimulus is another group, if those two groups are very uh, separated in terms of their phase, the phase at which they occur. So that's indicated by this top left plot 
okay, where, say, our red phases are our hit trials and our blue phases are our missed trials, and we hit between the phase 0 and 180 degrees and miss between the 180 degrees and 0 on the negative end. Um, then this would have a high phase bifurcation index. Um, in contrast, if the um, if the phase locking value for these two two groups was essentially zero, uh, in this paper they call the phase locking value the intertrial coherence or ITC then the phase bifurcation index would also be zero because you can't distinguish between the hit trials and the missed trials. So how these authors decided to use and define the phase bifurcation index is by calculating the difference between the phase locking value of each group. So all of the, the phase locking values of just the, of just group A, just the hits and stimulus perception and subtracting the phase locking value of all of the data. So by using both the phases of hits and misses, if there is a very positive, um, if this turns out to be a highly positive number, that's indicative that the uh, there is more phase clustering within the group than across the whole data set. And this is done for both the group of hit trials and the group of missed trials, and the product of these two are taken with one another. So if both of these are highly positive, then the phase bifurcation index is going to be positive. So again, the phase bifurcation index increases as the uh, as the two groups become more separated in terms of their phase